Fortnite, the worldwide online sensation, a wild 60 person experience where you can try your best to be half Bob the Builder, half Rambo. You have a great time laughing with friends at just how ridiculous one game could be, but there's a problem. Epic Games has divided the computer gamer base by opening a store to compete with Valve Steam. Is Epic Games ethical and how have years of business decisions impacted you? Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're gonna be taking a deep dive into Epic Games and their business practices. This company pioneered an entirely new style of gaming with Fortnite that has enjoyed five years of relevancy. Just to let you know, much of the episode will reference the world popular game. Streamers average over 100,000 viewers on any given day. That's not spanned out throughout a day. I mean, moment by moment. If you go to Twitch right now and browse the Fortnite category, chances are you'll see it has 100,000 plus viewers. What they've achieved over at Epic is gargantuan. Part of what spurred their rise to success is their relationship with Tencent, a massive Chinese-based media company. A couple years ago, we featured Tencent in an episode and I highly encourage you to check it out, especially if you've never heard of them. To summarize, Tencent is involved to some degree with so many gaming companies that their fingerprints are literally everywhere. So naturally, when Epic Games has shares owned by Tencent, accusations flew that the company was a shady company now. So let's take a closer look and find out if it's true. Epic Games started out as Potomac Computer Systems, or PCS, founded by Tim Sweeney in 1992. Originally, his company was built for computer consultation. In 1991, Sweeney set out to be a computer consultant. Before that, he worked at a computer hardware store making minimum wage while simultaneously mowing lawns as an entrepreneur for $20 an hour. And for anyone curious, it would be about 40 bucks an hour today. Sweeney wanted to apply that same principle to a tech company. According to the founder, I was going to start a little computer consulting business where you create little custom databases or things for people, but that took a lot of work actually, and I didn't get anywhere with it. It's interesting to see this mega company first described as an abject failure. While Sweeney floundered in the database market, he had developed his very first game, ZZT. And don't bother looking up for an acronym because it doesn't really mean anything. And side note, having a baseless acronym in modern communication is both entertaining and aggravating, but that's neither here nor there. Still owning all the business stationery like cards and letterheads, Sweeney decided to publish ZZT under Potomac Computer Systems. The game was considered a success, selling three to four copies daily amounting to $100. Sweeney took the results as a hint and dove into full-time game development. It was clear that there was some real money to be made in that business. I was trying to grow PCS into a real company. So at that point, I realized that we needed a serious name. So I came up with Epic Mega Games, kind of a scam to make it look like we were a big company. And all right, you heard it from the owner himself. Epic Games is a scam. Thank you so much for watching and... Well, I thought it was at least a little entertaining. So Epic Mega Games was clever linguistics to associate a big name to a one-man company. He was competing with gaming companies behind classic FPS games like Doom and Quake, so he had to look bigger than he really was. An early gaming version of David v. Goliath kind of situation. While Epic matured as a gaming company, Sweeney recognized that he lacked a strong sales background. In 1992, he joined with Mark Rain, a former employee from ID Software. Rain made major contributions to the company's marketing arm, making deals that made a lot of money. By 1996, Epic had 30 employees, including renowned game developer, Cliff Blazkinski. By 1997, their staff increased to 50 worldwide. In 1998, they finished their first 3D first-person shooter game, Unreal. The making of this particular game changed the gaming industry forever. The Unreal Engine is the world's most successful gaming software, earning years of accolades. Epic started licensing the core technology to other game developers. In 1999, the company finally dropped the Mega and simply became Epic Games. 2006 was a big year as Epic moved into the console gaming industry with Gears of War for Xbox 360. From 2006 to 2011, Epic enjoyed a number of successes and growth, but beneath an era of prosperity lingered a shadow that threatened to tear the company down. In June 19th, 2007, Canada-based gaming company Silicon Knights sued Epic Games for breach of contract and other disparaging claims. At the time, Silicon looked to receive $75,000 in damages. The suit is based on a dozen causes of action, including fraud, negligent misrepresentation, intentional interference with contractual relations, intentional interference with prospective economic advantage, breach of warranty, and a violation of North Carolina's Unfair and Deceptive Trade Practices Act. 
The claim made in 2007 alleged that Epic Games gave Silicon Knights a significantly inferior software engine for their game development. While SK was utilizing the Unreal Engine 3, Epic Games collected a fee for usage. For reasons not mentioned in the report, the problem Silicon encountered with the engine severely delayed their own game development and impacted their own revenue. SK accused Epic Games of holding the working software for themselves and using the fee earnings to finish the first Gears of War. The plaintiff suggests that Epic actually never intended to give them a working copy of Unreal 3. SK ended up abandoning the Unreal Engine altogether and developing their own. In August, as one would expect from a large company, Epic Games responded with a countersuit, alleging that Silicon Knights violated their copyright by using parts of their engine to develop the Silicon Knights engine, which they admitted to in 2006. Silicon Knights were indeed working on a gaming engine, but were they trying to get software coding for free? Also, Epic says that SK knew when it signed on that Epic was still working on certain features of Unreal Engine 3 and that features would continue to be developed and added as Epic completed Gears of War. As such, Epic claims that SK knew when it committed to the licensing agreement that Unreal Engine 3 may not meet its requirements and may not be modified to meet them. Epic also argued that hindering the success of any SK games did not benefit Epic. To the contrary, any games poorly reviewed using the Unreal Engine would impact their ability to lease it out. On May 30th, 2012, after six years of litigation, Epic won the lawsuit against Silicon Knights and was awarded $4.5 million in damages. In a lopsided legal victory, the courts denied all of SK's claims and ruled completely in favor of Epic Games. SK quickly appealed the decision, but that move backfired on them, doubling the verdict to $9 million. U.S. District Judge James C. Dever III ruled that Epic provided proof that Silicon Knights maliciously copied coding from the Unreal Engine line for line, including notes that were unrelated to the engine. Silicon Knights even failed to remove or correct typographical errors Epic Games programmers had made in those comics, Judge Dever added. He also denied Silicon Knights request to reduce the jury award. So a massive gaming company was actually the victim of fraud. And honestly, that's not the result I expected here, but it does make sense. Based on Epic's website and press release, as described in the article cover SK's original lawsuit, it appears that Epic has sold licenses to Unreal Engine 3 to over 150 game developers and publishers. If the company was truly scamming other gaming companies, it's hard to believe that the other 140 plus companies would stay quiet, especially considering that Microsoft and Sony were the primary platforms for the engine. There's also the fact that Epic released a free version of Unreal called the Unreal Development Kit. The free version is still available to use. And for a moment, the shady accusations were averted, but not for long. In June, 2012, on the heels of the closure of Epic's legal battles, China-based giant Tencent acquired 40% of Epic Games for $330 million. The company's core philosophy was in a transition period. Tim Sweeney was interested in the games as a service model. And before we get into the Tencent era of Epic's life, we need to have a detailed, healthy discussion of what that means. Games as a service, also called living games, are a game genre that depicts games as a growing, changing entity. This gaming genre didn't begin on large console games, but on games that could be played with a cell phone or tablet. Farmville, the then popular Facebook game, was released in 2009 as the first widespread concept of a living game. You could plant certain seeds, get farming supplies, and watch your vegetation grow. But if you didn't stay consistent, your farm could suffer or even go to ruin. It was like playing The Sims, except there wasn't truly really any sort of pause or turn off button. If you didn't wanna lose your progress, you had to keep playing. This gaming genre evolved in 2012 with the inception of Clash of Clans and Candy Crush. Again, these mobile games radically changed the gaming landscape. These games were important because they were free. A player could theoretically play through these games without buying features, but the features made the game easier. Other game developers like Epic Games saw this as a lucrative option. Over the past 10 years or so, gaming companies have followed the mobile gaming lead and aspired to make living games. In order to keep funding for development, a pay system has grown called microtransactions. Imagine you've already purchased or downloaded a game, but there's a certain item that you can pay $5 to get. That in a nutshell is a microtransaction. We've talked about it before heavily in our Roblox episode, but it never hurts to review. Early on, game developers of many game genres used the system. Gamers began seeing a tendency of a pay to win system, meaning they had to pay money beyond the download in order to complete the game. A notable example of this are EA sports games like Madden and FIFA's Ultimate Team. After paying $60 for the basic game, they want you to spend even more for specific players. And if you aren't careful, you could easily spend hundreds on their systems. The overall stereotype associated with a game with microtransactions is such and such game withheld content from a consumer for the sole purpose of offering it later for those willing to pay. Some game critics would call that fraudulent, but I'm not gonna go down that rabbit hole on this current day. Nevertheless, this was the system that caught Epic's attention. Tencent's acquisition was the trade-off for them, helping Epic work on their GAAS system. 
Sweeney celebrated the purchase saying, as part of an investment, two Tencent representatives joined Epic's board of directors, in addition to the three directors and two observers appointed by Epic. This news did not go well inside or outside of the company. One of the first to leave was Rod Ferguson. Not mincing words, he explains in the interview that he had an idea of where Epic Games was going as a company and why Tencent was involved. He wanted nothing to do with the GAAS title. He left the company in August, 2012, but came back in 2014 only to work on Gears of War. Though he came back, Ferguson wasn't the only one to walk away because of Tencent. Cliff Blizkinski decided to walk away from Epic Games in October that same year. He too cited an issue with the vision of Tencent's acquisition that was brought forward, not to mention a cynical view of the gaming industry. Unlike Ferguson, Cliff didn't return to the company. Other members of the company left, most of them saying they didn't believe in the free to play model. On the outside, Epic Games received just as much backlash. By the time of the acquisition, Tencent had already earned quite a negative reputation. I won't rehash all of the previous Tencent episode right now, though honestly, I should probably make an update episode because so much more has happened, but it's safe to say that Epic Games adopted some of their negative public perceptions. In the same way that TikTok has been accused of leaking user data to the CCP, Epic Games was accused of sharing personal gamer information with Tencent. Aside from the alleged data sharing, the general public also alleged that Epic Games would allow Tencent to control the content that Epic released. But is it true? Has Epic Games ever produced content influenced by Tencent or China? Before we answer that question, I wanna point out that Epic Games has already cooperated with the government in creating a game, but it wasn't China's. In 2013, shortly after the Tencent acquisition, Epic Games partnered with the United States Army. The gaming company made a deal to provide the Unreal 3 engine for the US Army's dismounted soldier training system after intelligent decisions licensed the technology in support of a contract with the military's development and engineering command. Yes, Epic provided simulated training for new army recruits. Even more interesting than Rachel Weber's coverage of the event is one of the comments, and I'm going to heavily paraphrase it. Matthias Johannesson, co-founder of Sky Goblin, essentially said, they would gladly fight against the idea that video games are the direct cause of violent actions and tragedies we've seen. Video games are no more influential to a person's decision making a book, music, or cinema. However, you can argue that the same tools in US Army hands are used to recruit and train soldiers for combat. It's no surprise to see government militaries using games. It would be naive to think that other countries aren't doing the same. When it comes to whether a gaming country supports a certain country or military, it doesn't matter. Video game creators should be more focused on their creations as opposed to representing any political or military body. But if someone rolls a truck full of money to you as an offer, it's not surprising that a company would choose to get paid. Now that we've hopped down that rabbit hole, we get back to the question, does Epic Games kowtow to Tencent's desires and include Chinese influence? Let's go back to the specifics of that 2012 acquisition. Tencent forked over an excess of $300 million, but what did they get in return? In exchange for Tencent's help, Tencent acquired approximately 48.4% of Epic, then issued share capital, equating to 40% of total Epic, inclusive of a bull stock and employee stock options. Tencent Holdings has the right to nominate directors to the board of Epic Games and thus counts as an associate of the group. They get to have two voting members on a five member board of directors, 40% of voting power for 40% ownership. Tim Sweeney, the founder remains the majority shareholder of Epic Games, but words don't mean anything, actions do. Tim Sweeney has repeatedly denied the idea that Epic Games answers to anyone. I'm very surprised to find that evidence points towards Sweeney telling the truth here. Recently in 2019, Tencent and TikTok had a bitter legal battle. TikTok accused Tencent of censorship, particularly TikTok videos. And can I just say that this is something I would expect Tencent to do given its history? Anyway, Sweeney was asked if he would also condemn TikTok. He staunchly and repeatedly refused. That will never happen on my watch as founder, CEO, and controlling chairman. This was further illustrated when China heavily restricted video games from their citizens. Epic completely pulled out as a result while Tencent didn't. We see a great example with the ongoing Hong Kong protest, which is an issue too deep to go into great detail in this episode right now. After Activision Blizzard received major backlash from banning a player, Blitzchung, in support of Hong Kong, hello again, Blizzard, Sweeney made a statement once again, reinforcing his stance. Epic supports everyone's right to express their views on politics and human rights, an Epic spokesman said in a statement. We wouldn't ban or punish a Fortnite player or content creator for speaking on these topics. So from a public standpoint, Epic Games has followed through on their stance independent of Tencent. But was there a concern about data sharing in Epic? Actually, yes, but it isn't quite what you'd think. The core accusation came from a Reddit topic called Epic Games Store, Spyware, Tracking, and You. The author brings a number of accusations against the gaming giant that seem substantiated by the computer owner's computer functions. 
The pictures are highlighted instances where Epic Games Store is actually trying to access information on the computer. Combined with their association with Tencent, it seemed that Epic was finally caught being shady, until it wasn't. PC World investigated the claims and clarified the post. The two cases of spyware-like behavior by Epic cited in it a file called tracking.js and the creation of a local copy of Steam files without first asking the user's permission were later clarified to be tied to the revenue sharing system that Epic Game Store uses to pay out content creators. For PC gamers, there are actually a large number of things that impact what reads your files. There's anti-chat software, Fiddler, AKA the basic web reading functions, actual store activity if you use Steam related to Fiddler, Before Epic Games pushed for exclusive titles, there was also the case where it scans similar titles from other storefronts to make sure they didn't intermingle. These are actually features that have been in the Unreal Engine for years. Epic was, once again, legitimately exonerated of accusations. Perhaps we've judged this company a little too harshly. But wait, here comes the Epic Game Store. And before we dig into that, let's take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. If you're anything like me, planning is an absolute necessity just to make it through the day. And when I'm saying planning, I'm planning everything. Everything's written down on whiteboards. I know what I'm doing, what I'm eating, and I know probably weeks in advance. That's why I really love HelloFresh. HelloFresh delivers fresh pre-portioned ingredients to your door every single week, or if you don't wanna do every single week, they can do it whenever it works for your schedule, which is great for someone like me. You can pick your favorites from 50 different weekly options and skip weeks when you need to, change your delivery date or update your preferences all within the HelloFresh app, which is seriously the easiest thing in the world to use. And HelloFresh's chefs really know how to diversify the menu with seasonal recipes like salmon limon and pasta primavera. And HelloFresh even has fit and wholesome recipes for satisfying and nutritious meals that you can feel good about with six recipes per week to choose from, including low calorie and carb conscious options too. So make sure you go to hellofresh.com casket16 and use code casket16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Again, that's hellofresh.com casket16 and use code casket16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Once upon a time, if I shaved my legs, I'd step out of the shower looking like I was on the losing end of a battle with a tiny animal. So many cuts and so much blood. Because no matter how hard I tried, I could never shave around my knees or ankles without some kind of bloodletting. And that's no longer, thanks to Athena Club. Athena Club's razor has built-in skin guards that are gentle on curves and help prevent razor burn. Their razor blade is surrounded by a water-activated serum with shea butter and hyaluronic acid. And their razor kit, by the way, it's $9. And for that $9, you're gonna get two blade heads, a magnetic hook for shower storage, and your choice of handle color. And there's six color options, and you can choose how often they send replacement blades too. So show your skin you care with the Athena Club Razor Kit. Sign up today and you'll get 20% off your first order. Just go to athenaclub.com and use promo code CASKET. That's athenaclub.com with promo code CASKET for 20% off. The game market system is pretty unfair, Sweeney explained at a keynote address as part of Gamescom DevCom. All of the app stores take 30% of revenue per transaction. That's strange because MasterCard and Visa can do a transfer for $3. Now, there isn't evidence that suggests that Epic is shady in terms of committing fraud or sharing your information with Tencent slash China, but Epic has made moves recently that are quite anti-consumer. The Epic Game Store opened in 2018, right around the time that Fortnite was officially released. At the time, Valve's Steam store had a monopoly on computer games. Epic moved to challenge them by bringing up their own store. So far, nothing too bad about that. That was until EGS began pushing to make games exclusive to their store. One of the most controversial moves was made for the Metro series. One of the biggest announcements that Epic made when it launched its storefront was that Metro Exodus, the third title in the series from 4A Games, would be available for purchase exclusively on the Epic Games Store. The news came just weeks before that title launched and after eager fans had already given Valve their money to pre-order the title on Steam. Steam encouraged the backlash, accusing EGS of mistreating the customers. Epic Games followed its history of attacking a veritable Goliath with a David mentality, and in this case, it bit them hard. Simply put, it's kind of hard to sustain a David mentality when you have become the Goliath. Steam successfully spun the decision as a big company trying to take advantage of its consumers. Looking back at game reviews from Metacritic, the Metro games dropped from a 90% approval rate to a 45% approval rating, solely on the anger against Epic Games. A spokesperson for the company admitted that the move was poorly timed and owned up to the negative backlash. Yeah, I'd say forcing a game developer to go back on their word is tactless at best. But Tim Sweeney made it known that EGS would continue to be aggressive in securing exclusive titles. 
They have an aggressive business plan focused more on getting all the titles that they can. They offer prospective game developers an 88% cut compared to Steam's 70% offer. So that means that game developers are more inclined to maximize their revenue and exclusively sell through EGS. There isn't anything inherently bad about a blitz style economic strategy, but this is an anti-consumer strategy. Their decisions split the player base. We already have to remember account information for email, streaming, social media, not to mention our phone number, social security number, and license number. Now the player base also has to remember multiple gaming accounts and passwords. Do you really have to create another store to solve the issue? No, I'll tell you what it is. Epic just wants a bigger piece of the pie. Just because they aren't alone, doesn't mean they're not guilty of it. No matter how they preach it, this is not a gamer first mentality. They aren't criminals or scammers, but don't be deceived, they aren't out for your best interest either. There are similar arguments with major title games and console companies like how Microsoft decided not to make Call of Duty console exclusive in February. Console companies, for the most part, embrace the idea of selling on multiple platforms because after all, that's more money for them ultimately. Publicity figures also cite the idea that you care about the gamers who've been long involved with the titles in question. EGS is not so compassionate. But exclusive games have been a point of discussion for years, so what's the issue? Much of the problem lies in the storefront itself. When objectively looking at Steam games in comparison to EGS games, there are a number of glaring features missing, and here's some. The ability to save game progress remotely and automatically in the cloud storing multiple user profiles that can be mapped to different games, a review system, dedicated forums, account sharing, and streaming to other devices. These are all features that Steam provide, and when reviewed, Steam was proven to be a superior store system to Epic. There's the idea that Epic is working on improving their store, but at the moment, they're forcing you to deal with an inferior product simply by making some games you want unavailable on Steam. So is it shady? Well, To a degree, a company should be valued more on the merit of what they do, not solely by what they have. The bright side is that you, the customer, have the opportunity to make your voice heard with your wallet. You can simply choose not to pay Epic Games for an inferior storefront. It might cost you some of your favorite games though, but the storefront dispute doesn't end with Steam either. Epic Games eventually looked to mobile gaming to expand Fortnite's popularity. Remember the quote disputing the 30% revenue cut done by larger computer gaming stores? The EGS decided to tackle that indirectly by attempting to funnel traffic to their store. In the summer of 2018, it was announced that Fortnite was hitting the mobile platform. The gaming industry quickly discovered the potential of revenue through mobile gaming. Today, over 6 billion people own a smartphone, so it's no surprise that mobile gaming now makes up over 52% of the market, bringing in over $90 billion of revenue in 2021. The world of mobile gaming has come a long way in the past 10 years, experiencing a dramatic rise that matches the gaming industry as a whole. It's no wonder that everyone wants a piece of that big pie, but there was still the issue of the cut Google and Apple were primed to take. Tim Sweeney said, "'We should not accept this as status quo. We should constantly be on the lookout for better solutions. We should look for ways to cut past the middlemen.'" On August 13th, 2020, Epic Games updated Fortnite's gaming system, reducing the price of V-Bucks, Victory Bucks is Fortnite's form of currency, by 20%. But what was the catch? It was only 20% cheaper if the consumer purchased directly from Epic. If they made the same purchase through the App Store or through the Google Play Store, then they weren't given the discount. Sweeney referenced the 30% revenue cut as the reason why they couldn't make the discount through all systems. Even though it benefits the consumer for the most part, I'd still say this is just a hair underhanded. You know, I'm not going to champion for large corporations, but I genuinely think that a highly competitive gaming market almost always results in a win for consumers. This is more about the ethics and representations of actions. Epic was trying to sidestep Apple and Microsoft for the whole damn pie. And I don't know, it kind of rubs me the wrong way. Apple and Google, as you would expect, weren't going to just let that slide. That same day, within hours actually, both giants removed Fortnite from their storefront, citing a violation of the TOS. Both Apple and Google painted Epic as a spoiled company that wanted special treatment. Given their statements three years prior, it seems as if Epic Games were prepared for what happened. Tim Sweeney immediately sued Apple and Google for antitrust, anti-competitive violations and followed with statements for developer freedom. This is what he said when he took to Twitter. At the most basic level, we're fighting for the freedom of people who bought smartphones to install apps from sources of their choosing, the freedom for creators of apps to distribute them as they choose, and the freedom of both groups to do business directly. Interestingly enough, it kind of sounds like the right-wing social media episode that we recently did. Apple responded by threatening to completely erase Epic's developer accounts on their platforms by August 28, 2020, but Epic asked the courts to block the action in fear of major damages to the Unreal Engine. The courts granted Epic their request for their Unreal Engine, but not for Fortnite. Regarding Fortnite, the judge placed the blame squarely on Epic's shoulders. 
Oddly enough, there isn't much commentary on Epic's battle against Google, just Apple. On May 21st, 2020, Apple even suggested that Microsoft was the real antagonist behind the lawsuits. Now, the eternal battle between Microsoft and Apple would likely go longer than this episode. The Microsoft-Apple feud began all the way back in the late 80s when Apple accused Microsoft of illegally using their software. This war between computer companies has not gone away since that event. The theory is that Microsoft is using Epic as an aggression against Apple. I don't necessarily believe that, but Microsoft benefits from this litigation. To be honest, all these companies are like hungry, hungry hippos trying to consume each other as fast as possible. As a result of that litigation, Epic joined Spotify, the European Publishers Council, EPC, and 10 others to form the Coalition for App Fairness. The group describes itself as an independent nonprofit organization founded by industry leading companies to advocate for freedom of choice and fair competition across the app ecosystem. These groups have taken Apple head on and accused them of fostering an exploitative marketplace. Considering Microsoft's alleged absence from their mission, I could see why Apple made their accusation. There is another short accusation made against Epic regarding their social networking app, House Party. Allegedly, House Party led to other apps like Netflix and Spotify being hacked in March, 2020. Currently, there's no evidence supporting these claims and Epic has offered $1 million to anyone who can actually prove it. So has Epic Games shown itself to be a shady company? If we're being completely honest, I'd say not really, not fully, at least not in the classical scamming sense. This company hasn't broken any laws that I know of, but there is a reason to be cautious when dealing with them. As of this point, Epic Games is worth about $30 billion. They did indeed bring the Unreal Engine to life and changed gaming forever. So why would I advise caution? Their involvement with Tencent is why. While they don't directly take orders from Tencent, it appears that Epic has adopted the Tencent mentality, an aggressive borderline monopolistic approach to the market. They've acquired about 30 different companies in this time frame too. And Epic has accused other companies of pushing monopolies, but I'd suggest that the company is projecting. As a company, they didn't use aggression arbitrarily. Tencent and Epic both have aspirations to be the largest companies in the world. You can tell that by their actions, which are similar to the ravenous monster, hungry to consume everything around it. That's a dramatization, of course, but the fact is so close to the truth that it's just a little bit unnerving. This semi-hostile ideology has benefited and hurt consumers. There's no doubt about it. The EGS is subpar by comparison, but consumers are forced to shop in it anyway. I genuinely believe that Epic has proven to be law abiding, not fraudulent, but what would happen if you fell into their legal or financial crosshairs? Chances are they will attack and run over anything in their way. Consumer or not, make sure you watch out. And I hope to God I don't have to make an update to this episode in a few years, but something tells me this is just the precursor. And as with all huge companies, something bad is bound to come to light. Though obviously I hope not. We'll see, we'll check in about two, three years from now. But with all of that being said, that's where I'm gonna end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. And if you did, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I appreciate you spending some of your time here today. I know you could be doing a whole lot of things with it and listening to me prattle on about Epic Games for 20, 30 minutes is pretty awesome. So thanks, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.